um, just briefly, if uh, everyone could turn on their cameras and uh, just so our scoring panelists and myself can check to see if there's any uh, potential conflicts. And I don't personally see any. Um, I'm not sure if our scoring panelists have any concerns. I do not. Uh, I'm Steve. My camera does not work today. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm Liz. I don't see any conflicts. Great. Um, so I think uh, since there are no conflicts, um, I think we're ready to get started. Um, so I believe we are ready to call the case of Weirs v. Uh, Lush Fertilizer Incorporated. Uh, are the plaintiffs ready for trial today? Yes, Your Honor. And is the defense ready for trial? Yes, Your Honor. And I do see both teams have uploaded their rosters. Uh, any of the scoring panelists have any issues accessing those? Yes, I do. Uh, can they uh, show them on the screen so I can take a picture of them? That's, that's fine if you guys uh, want to do that. I can also do the same thing. Yes, I can screen share. Sorry for the echo. It's OK. Here's this. Check on it. Thank you. Our timekeepers would also be happy to screen share our roster. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're sorted with the rosters. Um, so I just want to confirm with everybody that um, you understand that this is being recorded and everyone has uh, consented to have this uh, particular round recorded. See lots of nods and no objections. Um, I just wanna inform the teams as well as the gallery members um, that during the course of this round, the Colorado Bar Association may be taking photos um, of the round and uh, your Participation in the round has already uh, provided your consent to have your photo taken by the Bar Association. Um, I will just ask uh, anybody who is in the gallery um, who may be connected with the teams but is not participating in the actual round, um, if they could please uh, leave the virtual courtroom. I, believe that I see everybody who's on the roster in the courtroom. Um, and remind everyone that we're not gonna be taking recesses today, uh, particularly between witnesses or between the plaintiffs and the defense's case in chiefs. Um, I want to, that is, you know, in spite of any sort of medical emergency or anything like that. Um, and, I will just emphasize the importance to keep it in the time frame, and I do have the discretion to stop time uh, if I need to, and I, I, I will exercise that discretion if I think it's appropriate. And I also wanna remind the teams starting out, um, if there are any disputes about um, rule violations, my rulings, anything like that, um, that those can be raised uh, in compliance with the rules of the competition. And that your compliance with the rules of the competition will be considered during your individual performances. And again, I just wanna confirm that no coach or non-participating team member is in the courtroom right now. 
I don't see anyone I haven't seen on the rosters. And we can go ahead and start with having uh, the plaintiffs introduce themselves and their witnesses. Good um, afternoon, your honor, members of the jury and opposing counsel. My name is Katie Dolan, and today I will be conducting the direct examination of Dr. Casey Rogers, the cross-examination of Dr. Devin Williams, and presenting the closing argument on behalf of the plaintiff. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the jury and opposing counsel. My name is Adele Donda, and today I will conduct the direct examination of Dakota Weirs and the cross-examination of Skylar Weirs. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the jury and opposing counsel. My name is Madeline Melenz, and today I will be performing the opening statement, the direct examination of Carson Durst, and the cross-examination of Blake Doncourt. May our witnesses present themselves. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Millie Bjork, and today I am Dakota Weirs. Good afternoon, my name is Kyla Letko, and today I am Casey Rogers. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Tom McKissick, and today I'll be Carson Durst. And does the defense have anybody to introduce? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the jury and opposing counsel. My name is Lydia Brisky, and I, alongside my co-counsel, represent the defense. Permission for my co-counsel to introduce themselves? Please. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the jury and opposing counsel. My name is Ainsley Bitgood, and I will be presenting the opening statement. And it, counsel, you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I said, um, good afternoon, your honor, members of the jury and opposing counsel. My name is Emma Seneshin and I will be making the closing argument. Permission for our witnesses to introduce themselves, please. Good afternoon, my name is Julie Perry and I am Dr. Devin Williams. Good afternoon, my name is Kate Sutherland and I'm Skylar Weirs. Good afternoon, my name is Saffron Bennett Spurlock and I'm Blake Doncourt. Excellent, thank you everybody for introducing yourselves. Um, <clears throat> so at this time I'm going to swear in all of the witnesses and uh, competitors, attorneys and uh, scoring panelists. So if you could all turn on your uh, cameras, I understand, uh, Steve, that you're not able to today. I trust you. Um, for the team members, I'm going to ask everybody uh, participating in the tournament to go ahead and stand uh, while you take your oath. And if team members, you could please raise your right hands. Team members, do you promise that the presentation you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? The all nods and no head shaking. Um, witnesses, do you promise that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to your witness statements, that you will not add material facts or opinions which are not contained in the case problem, and that you will follow the rules and procedures of the mock trial competition. You see all nods and no head shaking. And gallery members, including teacher and attorney coaches, family members and friends, uh, if you could please raise your right hands. Do you promise to represent yourselves as positive role models and to behave in a manner that exemplifies ethical and professional sportsmanship during and after this mock trial? And scoring panelists, if you could please raise your right hands. Do you promise to adjudicate the mock trial competition as fairly and objectively as possible in accordance with the facts, procedures, and rules of the mock trial competition? Yes. Thank you. And I do see, just, just to clarify, I'm not scoring on this as well. I'm just the presiding judge. 
I see three scoring panelists, so I'm going to assume that that's the case. Okay. At this time, I do believe we are uh, ready to begin. Would the plaintiffs like to give their opening statement? All right. Actually, I apologize. Are there any pretrial issues that we need to handle? Yes, Your Honor. Um, could we address a couple preliminary matters before we begin? So we ask your permission for all admitted exhibits for both the plaintiff and defense to be published to the jury once they are admitted. Michelle. We ask that exhibits for both the plaintiff and defense not be screen shared until they are admitted. And we ask to reserve any time remaining in closing argument for rebuttal. And finally, we ask that if there's any technical difficulties that time be stopped for both the plaintiff and defense. You will. Thank you, Your Honor. And any pretrial issues for the defense? No, Your Honor. Right. So again, I will just ask if the uh, plaintiffs would like to give their opening statements. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Permission to proceed. Go ahead. Good afternoon, counsel, your honor, and members of the jury. My name is Madeline Malenz, and today I represent the plaintiff, Dakota Weirs. Profits over people. Members of the jury, this case is about a company that put their profits first in front of their employees, safety regulations, and most importantly, Dakota Weirs' life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you for a moment to put yourselves in the shoes of Dakota Weirs, a young woman with her whole life ahead of her. She had an acceptance to Juilliard, a promising musical career and a job that she loved. Now, put, your, put yourself in her shoes again when she tells you that she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, effectively ending her life as she knew it. She will describe for you how she can no longer play the piano, a favorite pastime that brought her closer to her grandfather. Miss Weirs will tell you that she can no longer chase her dreams at Juilliard or volunteer or even work anymore. And why, why was Dakota Weirs' life permanently altered? Because lush fertilizer puts profits over people. The plaintiff has the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence that lush fertilizers negligence is responsible for Ms. Weirs' cancer. This is a burden we gladly accept. First, we will show that the defendant, lush fertilizer in this case, manufactured a fertilizer product containing a chemical compound known as Drufo. This is not in dispute. You will hear from many witnesses today both from the defense and the plaintiff, who will all say that this is true. Lush manufactured a fertilizer product containing Drufo. Second, the testimony will show that Lush was negligent by failing to exercise reasonable care to prevent the product from creating an unreasonable risk of harm. You will hear from Carson Durst, a former Lush employee that was crucial in the development of Drufo. He will testify that Lush knew that Drufo could cause cancer in its non-baked form. You will also hear testimony from Lush's own CEO, Blake Doncourt, that she was well aware that Drufo posed a risk to consumers like Ms. Weirs, yet she still chose not to bake it. Even though, as Ms. Doncourt will testify to, baking Drufo would only increase the cost by 2%. Yes, only two pennies for every dollar. Third, you will hear evidence that Ms. Weirs was one of the people Lush should have expected to use this product. Ms. Weirs herself will testify to this. She worked as a landscaper at Haven Landscaping and used a fertilizer manufactured by Lush that contained Drufo. Finally, the evidence will show that Ms. Weirs had damage, damages that were caused by Lush's negligence while the product was being used in a manner that Lush should have reasonably expected. To prove this, you will hear testimony from Dr. Rogers that there is in fact a link between Drufo and cancer. You will also hear that Ms. Weirs has a twin and the only aspect of their lives that's different 
is that while Dakota Weirs worked as a landscaper where she was exposed to Drufo, Skylar Weirs did not. The plaintiff will prove its case by a preponderance of the evidence, after which you must consider the defense's comparative negligence claim, which is that Ms. Weirs failed to do something that reasonably careful people would do to protect themselves from the claimed danger created by the product and that this negligence caused Ms. Weirs' cancer. The defense will say that Drufo's label contained a caution statement and safety recommendations, yet these so-called warnings only referenced eye irritation. Not that the primary active ingredient in the fertilizer was a known carcinogen. Members of the jury, Ms. Weirs does not have eye irritation. She has cancer. And while nothing can reverse this, it is time that Lush pays for their actions and stops putting profits over people. That is why members of the jury, the plaintiff asks that you find in favor of Ms. Weirs and against Lush Fertilizer. Thank you. Thank you, counsel, and uh, from the defense. May I proceed, Your Honor? Please. Members of the jury, we are here today because Lush Fertilizer is being wrongfully sued by Dakota Weirs. They claim that a compound in Lush's fertilizer, Drupo, caused Dakota's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But the evidence presented today will show that this is simply not the case. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very emotional case, but it is your job to consider the facts and evidence. Today, you will hear the plaintiff present the wrong science and accuse the wrong defendant. So you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, must give the right answer. Wrong science, wrong defendant, right answer. The plaintiff will present science in an effort to support their claim that Drufo causes cancer. The plaintiff's claim entirely depends on an inconclusive test conducted by Casey Rogers. Casey Rogers will testify that her study has never been replicated, nor has it been peer reviewed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no way of knowing whether the same conclusions would be reached if this test were replicated. For all we know, they got lucky. That's the wrong science. Today, my co-counsel and I will present to you the right science. You will hear from Dr. Devin Williams, who will testify that her labs found no evidence that the use of Drufo causes cancer. You will also hear from Skylar Weirs, who will testify that Drufo does not contain any carcinogenic ingredients. She will also testify that there are no tests that show that, that Drufo has a direct correlation with cancer. And finally, Blake Doncourt will testify to Lush conducting numerous tests and taking all necessary precautions to eliminate reasonable risk. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the right science. Today, you will hear Carson Durst, a former employee of Lush, try to claim that Lush could have done more to ensure Drufo's safety, but this is simply false. They will also claim that Lush manipulated data and neglected to evaluate all sources of evidence, but you will see today that this is not the case. Lush used the right science in all steps of the production of Drufo. Lush conducted tests that showed that Drufo was safe and put all necessary recommendations on packaging. The plaintiff will claim that Lush is unsafe because they did not bake their fertilizer, but it simply isn't necessary because all tests and evidence say that Lush fertilizer is safe without baking. As well as making claims based on the wrong science, Dakota is suing the wrong defendant. There is an array of unaccounted for factors. Today, you will hear Dakota testify to using many different products. We can't even be sure a fertilizer is at fault. For all we know, it could be a household cleaning product. By the end of today's trial, it will be apparent that the plaintiff has not met their burden of proof. They must prove by a preponderance of the evidence every element of the claim of negligence. Through our science, it will be clear that Lush exercised reasonable care to prevent its fertilizer from creating an unreasonable risk of harm. Although this is a very emotional case, it is your job to consider the facts and evidence. We have nothing but sympathy for Dakota, but Lush fertilizer did not cause their cancer. The plaintiff's claim is backed by wrong science and Dakota is suing the wrong defendant. So you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, must give the right answer. It will be clear that the facts and evidence reflect that lush fertilizer put people over profits. 
Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And would the plaintiffs like to call their first witness? Yes, Your Honor. The plaintiff would like to call Ms. Dakota Weirs to the stand. Good afternoon. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Dakota Weirs. Ms. Weirs, will you explain for the jury why you brought a civil action against Lush Fertilizer? Of course, I'm here today because I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and I believe that it was caused by Lush Fertilizer, which contains Trufo. How has that affected your life on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, gosh, affected is an understatement. Having cancer has ruined my life in so, so many ways. Before you got sick, tell me what your life was like. My life was amazing before I got sick. I really lived it to the fullest. I had a job at Haven Landscaping. I worked really, really hard in school. I was a part of National Honor Society. And of course, the most important part of my life was playing piano. I even got a scholarship to Juilliard to play there. Why was piano so important to you? I mean, Piano was a way for me to connect with my grandfather who passed away when I was younger. He was actually the one who introduced me to piano. And whenever I played, it just, it made me feel like he was still there. What are your plans for the future? Well, my plan for the future was to go to Juilliard. Like I said, I got a scholarship and I was so, so excited to play the piano there. and felt like I was going to be following in my grandfather's footsteps, but little did I know that actually means I'm falling into the grave. What do you mean this was your plan? After I got sick, I, I, I couldn't go to Juilliard anymore because like I said, I'm unable to play the piano. And once, once this happened, I knew my life was truly over. And you know, this is just one of the many things that this awful disease has taken away from me. How else would you say cancer has changed your life? I mean, like I said, cancer has ruined my life. I'm so sick all the time. I can't work. I can't volunteer. I, I used to take care of people when I volunteered and now it just, it always feels like I'm the one being taken care of. I'm sorry to hear that. Now let's talk about your family. Do you have any siblings? I do. I have a twin, Skylar. Growing up, how did your life differ from your twin Skylar's life? I mean, our lives were pretty similar. We were practically attached at the hip, you could say. Typical twins, except since Skylar's allergic to grass, I got a job at Haven Landscaping when we were both going into high school. We were 14 and Skylar didn't have that job. Was working at Haven Landscaping the only difference between you and Skylar? Yeah. What was your relationship like with Skylar? I mean, before I got sick, it was great. We were, like I said, practically best friends attached at the hip. But after I got sick, things with us, our relationship, it just, it just started to plateau. What do you mean your relationship started to plateau? Everything in our family started to be about money because I was now having all of these medical bills and it was putting such a burden on my family and I feel awful, but Skylar, because of this, ended up developing a gambling problem. Now, will you explain a little about what you did working at Haven Landscaping? For sure. I was a landscaping technician, they called it. I would work with a ton of different lawns. I would spread the seeds, fertilize them. But the only really life-altering part of that job was working with Drufo. What do you mean by life-altering? I mean, had I not have worked with lush fertilizer, which had Drufo in it, we wouldn't, wouldn't even be here today. And I would still be able to go to Juilliard and play the piano. And it, it didn't alter my life. It changed my life. When did you stop working there? I worked there all of high school, but I had to stop when I got sick. Now, please refer to exhibit one. What is exhibit one? Exhibit one. Uh, this is a copy of the label on the Lush fertilizer that I used at my job. How often did you use Lush fertilizer? Um, like I said, I just recently stopped working there. So 
I saw lush fertilizer or I saw this label and I used lush fertilizer a pretty decent amount. And where did this exhibit come from? My boss sent this to me, my old boss. Is this a true and accurate copy of the label you saw on the lush fertilizer? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I move to admit exhibit one into evidence. Any objection from the defense? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit one shall be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Permission to publish exhibit one to the jury? That's it. Now, Ms. Weirs, did anything on this label concern you? No, I honestly didn't really think anything of it because the only hazard is eye irritation and these safety recommendations don't really have any sense of urgency. And the fact that it only says it can cause eye irritation honestly made me disregard the whole thing. Did it indicate that the product may cause cancer? No, nothing on here indicates that you're going to get cancer from using it. So why didn't this label give you concern? I mean, take a pack of cigarettes, for example. There's a pretty clear warning on that packaging that smoking will probably give you lung cancer. So you know to be cautious. But when you look at this label that was on Lush Fertilizer, all it says is warning may cause eye irritation. Eye irritation is not the same as cancer. Could you please read what it says under the user safety recommendations in exhibit one? Yes. As with any spray fertilizer, utilize protective clothing that covers exposed skin. Use of a respirator or N95 mask is recommended. Did you wear any protective clothing such as long pants or a long sleeve shirt or even a mask? I didn't. I didn't really see a reason to. How is that supposed to protect my eyes? Why didn't you wear protective clothing? I mean, had I known the real danger was going to ruin my life and possibly kill me, of course I would have followed the recommendation. But if you look at this label, the only danger is eye irritation. How is wearing long pants and a mask supposed to protect my eyes? Finally, will you explain what you want out of this trial? Of course. I am here because I want to prove that working with lush fertilizer made me sick. My grandfather died and when I couldn't play piano anymore, my dreams died. And for all I know, I might die. And I just, I really wanna be able to speak up while I still can. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions and I pass this witness for cross-examination. And uh, would the defense like to uh, conduct cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Weirs. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start by saying that my co-counsel and I are truly sorry that you're living with cancer and that, you know, all of our hearts like really do go out to you during this difficult time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, to begin, you worked at Haven Landscaping for several years. I did. And your job there was spreading fertilizer. Yes, that was my primary task. And at that job, you used multiple different fertilizers. We did. I worked with a ton of lawns, so there were a couple fertilizers that we used. So, Ms. Weirs, because you used so many different products, you cannot be 100% certain that lush fertilizer caused your cancer. Lush fertilizer has Drufo, and it's been proven that Drufo causes cancer. And so, I mean, I'm pretty sure. But you cannot be 100% certain. I mean, I'm 100% certain. Ms. Weirs, as a matter of fact, you cannot be 100% certain that a fertilizer caused your illness. I mean, we can never know, but all of the facts lead to this. If my um, co-counsel could screen share exhibit one, is that okay, Your Honor? That's fine.
And if my um, co-counsel could just rotate the document. Yes, however uh, you see fit to make it uh, the most legible. Perfect. Co-counsel, could you please zoom in on the user safety recommendations portion of this label? Thank you. Now, Ms. Weirs, I know you already read this exhibit earlier today, but I'm just going to read it one more time. As with any spray fertilizer, utilize protective clothing that covers exposed skin. So according to Lush, you were supposed to wear protective clothing when working with its product. I believe it's a recommendation. So that's a yes. I mean, it's not a rule, it's a recommendation. Okay. And the company you worked for, Haven Landscaping, also required you to wear protective gear. I mean, no one really did. It was more of a unspoken rule. But they did. You were supposed to wear protective gear also according to your job. I mean, listen, no one else did. And I was 14 years old. How would I have known that not doing this was going to ruin my life? But Ms. Weirs, if you could just answer the question, you were supposed to wear protective gear according to the policies at Haven Landscaping. Yes, I was supposed to. But you didn't. No, no one did. And you did not wear long sleeves. It was so hot in the summer. I mean, I couldn't have. You did not wear pants. Same, same reason. You did not wear gloves. No, I didn't. Instead, you chose to wear a t-shirt and shorts to work. I didn't think that wearing the protective clothing was going to protect my eyes because if you also look at this label, it says the only danger is eye irritation. But you did wear shorts and a t-shirt to work? In the summer? Of course. Going back to the exhibit, the label reads use of a respirator or N95 face mask is recommended. Now, again, according to Lush, you were supposed to wear a mask when working with Lush fertilizer. To, to what? To protect my eyes? It didn't make sense to me. I was a high school student. A face mask would protect your eyes, wouldn't it? I mean, I don't think so. Okay, Ms. Weirs. The policies that Haven Landscaping had also, also advised you to wear a face mask. Advised me to, yes. And yet you still did not wear a face mask. I mean, no. And don't you think, I probably think about this every day. If I had known that I could have done this to, to save my life, of course I would have. Ms. Spears, you said that you didn't wear a face mask because you liked feeling the wind on your bare face. Yes. So, I mean, Ms. Spears, you really didn't take any safety precautions while working with this product. I, like I said, I didn't see a reason to. Okay. Um, Ms. Spears, you said that you were 14 years old when you were working with this product? That's when I started working there, yes. So... You were a minor. If my co-counsel could now scroll up to the hazard section of this label. Ms. Swears, please follow along with me as I read. Keep out of reach of children. So Ms. Swears, not only did you fail to take any safety precautions whatsoever, but you were not supposed to be using this product in the first place. I was just doing my job. My co-counsel can now stop screen sharing this exhibit. Ms. Weirs, luckily your doctor has not given up hope. I mean, yeah, but I've given up hope. I can't, I can't even play the piano and that's my whole life. But your doctor, a medical professional has not given up hope. I mean, yeah, but I know myself better than my doctor knows myself. You know yourself medically better than your doctor knows yourself. I know how I feel. Um, Ms. Weirs, you are also able to defer your scholarship to Juilliard for up to two years. Right, and there's no way of knowing if I'm going to get better in two years. I mean, at this, at this rate, I probably won't. But we just confirmed that your doctor said there's a chance. Yeah. No further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Weirs. Is there a reason you did not wear protective clothing? 
course there's a reason. I've said this a thousand times and I will say it again. I did not see a reason to wear protective clothing like pants and long sleeves to protect my eyes. I would have done it if I had known that it was going to ruin my life. And what type of mask did it say you should wear on the label in exhibit one? An N95 mask. Do N95 masks cover your eyes? Not that I know of. I've never seen N95 masks covering people's eyes. And why did you use Lush Fertilizer? I was just doing my job at Haven Landscaping. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. And does the uh, plaintiff have any other witnesses they'd like to call? Yes, Your Honor. The plaintiff calls Carson Durst to the stand. Good afternoon, Mr. Durst. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Hello, my name is Carson Durst. Did you ever work at Lush? Uh, yeah, I did. And when were you an employee there? From 2003 to 2006. I would like to talk about your time at Lush. What did you do there? Um, well, I was originally hired as an intern for the R&D team. And then after about three months, I was promoted to a full-time position as a product development engineer. What was your biggest project at Lush? Definitely working on Drufo. And where was the company at with the development of Drufo when you joined? Um, when I joined in 2003, the company was in the process of testing the safety of uh, some of the chemicals that made up Drufo. And what was your specific involvement in this process? Uh, I was tasked with researching one of those specific chemical compounds. I would now like to talk about your research more specifically. What did it involve? Um, while, while I was conducting my duties, uh, I came across one study from England, which concluded that uh, Drufo could be found carcinogenic in rats, but I couldn't find a similar study in humans. Your Honor, let the record reflect that I am asking both opposing counsel and the witness to look at Exhibit 3. It shall reflect. Mr. Durst, do you recognize this exhibit? Yes, I do. What is this exhibit? This is the study I was just referring to. And is this a fair and accurate copy of the study that you previously mentioned? As far as I can tell. At this time, I move for Exhibit 3 to be admitted into evidence. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 3 shall be admitted. Thank you. Mr. Durst, can you please read the line under results in this exhibit? Um, yes, our results show a statistically significant dose-related increase of malignant tumor-bearing animals, particularly in the group treated with 2,000 parts per million of C3NO9P, um, and an increase in incidence of lymphomas and leukemias in animals treated with 2,000 parts per million. Can you explain what this all means, simply speaking? Um, well, in layman's terms, that basically means that rats that were exposed to this chemical were statistically significantly more likely to develop cancer than rats that were not. And who did you tell about the research found in this exhibit? Um, well, normally once everyone's conducted their research, we, uh, our Jerry, our product manager would compile our findings into a single report and then that goes up the flagpole. And how did Lush respond when you alerted them to the results of this study? Well, how they responded exactly is above my pay grade, but I do know that a few months later, we got word that Lush would be conducting its own in-house study regarding Drufo and whether or not it was carcinogenic. And how were you instructed to do this in-house study? Uh, I received an email from Jerry. Your Honor, let the record reflect that I am asking both opposing counsel and the witness to look at Exhibit 4. It shall reflect. Mr. Durst, do you recognize this exhibit? Yeah. What is this exhibit? Uh, that's the email I was just talking about. And how are you made aware of this email? Uh, I received it in my work inbox. And who sent this to you? Uh, Jerry Langley, our product manager. 
Is this a fair and accurate copy of the email you previously mentioned? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. At this time, I move for exhibit four to be entered into evidence. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit four shall be admitted. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you please read the first line from the second paragraph, starting with following our labs through the end of that sentence? Yeah, so following our lab's June Drufo study, concerns have arisen regarding generalized findings of potential carcinogenic qualities identified in samples produced during a period earlier in the year. So to clarify, this email expressed concerns about Drufo having carcinogenic qualities. Uh, yeah, it did. And were you the only person to receive this email? Um, no, the recipients list was about 20 people. I don't know exactly who all received it, but I do know that Blake Doncourt's on that list. And who is Blake Doncourt? Uh, the CEO of Lush. Was there anything else notable in this email? Um, not necessarily in the email, but during uh, weekly meetings and stuff like that, I felt as though there was certain pressure from management for the internal studies to be read a certain way. And what did this pressure from management feel like? I felt as though management was encouraging us to conduct the study in such a way that would um, give them wiggle room, essentially, in case a lawsuit such as this came up. And what was your understanding of the conclusion management wanted? Um, I felt as though management wanted us to bury the causal link between Trufo and cancer. Now I'd like to talk more about Lush's actual in-house study. How did management handle the results of this study? Well, in December of 2003, Jerry gathered us all in a conference room uh, to have a meeting about our findings. And one thing that sticks out to me about that day was Alex Monroe, an upper echelon manager, was there, which wasn't, that was pretty abnormal. Normally, someone like that wouldn't attend our meetings. Objection, speculation. The, uh, I'll allow the uh, plaintiffs to lay a little bit more foundation about this witness's personal knowledge of who appears in these uh, meetings regularly. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Durst, do you attend these meetings regularly? Uh, yes, I did, it was part of my job. And are you aware of other employees and other colleagues of yours that also attended these meetings regularly? Uh, yes, I, I knew pretty much everyone on the R&D team. Um, Thank you. So what was discussed in this meeting? Um, well, one thing that specifically stands out to me again, I remember one scientist raised concerns that not only may Drufo be carcinogenic, but that it might perhaps be linked directly to non-Hodgkin's. Is that can you say? Uh, your Honor, pursuant to rule um, 801-2D, um, this is a hearsay exception as it was made by the party's agent or employee on a matter within the scope of that relationship while it existed. Any response from the defense? No response, Your Honor. I'm going to overrule the objection. Thank you. Would you like me to re-ask that question? Uh, yes, please. What was discussed in this meeting? Um, oh, right. Well, like I said, one thing, I don't remember exactly all that was discussed, but one thing that specifically stood out to me was a scientist raised concerns that Drufo might perhaps be directly linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what did you observe the um, management reaction to this? Um, well, the upper echelon manager, Alex Monroe, said something to the tune of, let's keep this in the walls until we figure out what we're doing. And then about a month or so later, a copy of the final report hit my desk. And what did this study conclude? Um, the study essentially concluded that more further research was required before any final conclusions could be drawn between the link of true phone cancer. And to your knowledge, was there anything missing from this final report? Well, I don't have access to all the research that was conducted, but based on my personal part of the study, uh, the study was pretty misleading and a decent amount of information was left out. And did this report make any safety recommendations? Uh, yes, it suggested that Drufo should be baked to eliminate any safety risks. Thank you. I have no further questions at this time.
Any cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good evening, evening, Mr. Durst. Good evening. You have a degree in chemical engineering? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Am I correct in saying you didn't graduate top of your class? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, college is very competitive environment. There's a lot of smart people that I went to school with. So no, I didn't, but I don't necessarily hold that against myself too much. Did you get your job at Lush after commiserating with Charles Duncourt about not having any luck finding a job? Well, yeah, I mean, getting a job right out of college is really hard. And so I think it was just lucky for me to have that connection in the field that I had studied. I just, you know, it was lucky. Is it true Blake pulled strings for you to get this position? Well, yeah, I mean, again, I was really lucky. I was able to use that connection to get a job right out of college. Most people really struggle with that. To reiterate for the jury, you're an engineer, not a toxicologist. Well, chemical engineer, um, but no, I'm not a toxicologist. You're not an oncologist? No. You're not an epidemiologist? Uh, no, I'm not. Nor are you a medical doctor? No, I'm not. When you began at Lush, you were an intern on the research and development team, correct? Uh, yeah. And you only served in this role for three months? Yeah, that's correct. So you base your concerns on a study performed by a team you had very little experience with? Well, no, I mean, well, I guess at that point I didn't have a ton of experience, but I did have experience conducting studies. I did stuff like that in college. Um, so no, I mean, I wouldn't say that experience was necessarily an issue. You found a study in identifying Drufa was carcinogenic in rats, correct? Uh, yes, yes, I did. But you never found a study suggesting it was carcinogenic in humans, isn't that right? Uh, no, I couldn't find if one had been conducted. You admit that you didn't have access to all the data analyzed by the research and development team? Um, no, I only know my piece. But based on my piece, it seemed, pretty, it seemed as though Drufo was carcinogenic to me. But yes, that's just my piece. And you admit that after you handed in your notebook, you could only speculate about what happened next? Uh, yeah, I was above my pay grade. Is it true you were forced to sign a performance improvement plan? Yeah, and you know, the timing of that felt a little weird to me. That came right on the heels of the concerns of Drufo being carcinogenic. And, you know, Drufo was so important to Lush's success that, I don't know, to me, those performance reviews felt a little shady, but I can't know exactly what was going on. And yeah, the performance reviews were bad. So you, you signed the performance improvement plan? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Sorry. And after you signed this plan, instead of improving your performance, you went to talk to Blake, correct? Well, it's not necessarily that I didn't, I was, you know, obviously I'm trying as hard as I can to do the best work I could. But on top of that, I did go to talk to Blake because like I said, the timing of the performance reviews felt a little shady to me. And I just wanted to let him know what was going on and tell him what I was thinking. So you asked him to intervene? Uh, yeah, I did. Did you ever bring your concerns to anyone's attention prior to your poor performance reviews? Concerns? Uh, sorry, can you restate? I'm a little confused. Of course. Did you ever bring your concerns to anyone's attention prior to your poor performance reviews? Uh, concerns regarding what? Uh, the rat study or your belief that Drufo is carcinogenic in humans? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. During my time conducting research, you know, my job was to conduct the research. Jerry's job was to look at the research. So, yeah, I know that Jerry Langley should have been informed. And after another abysmal performance review, you went to talk to Blake again, correct? Uh, yeah, I did. And this conversation left you disheartened? Well, yeah, I mean, because like I said, I felt as though the performance reviews were being unfair. And I, I was just disheartened that my longtime family friend wouldn't stick up for me, I guess. Soon after you were fired? Uh, yeah, I was, which again, that just made me feel worse. You applied for a job at Tara's Greenery, Lush's biggest competitor, sorry. Well, yeah, I mean, I just felt as though I was reading the writing on the walls. Uh, it didn't seem like I was gonna have a place at Lush much longer and I need a job. So yeah, I just, I started job searching. Um, fertilizer's what I knew, so Tara's Greenery made sense to me. You applied to get Blake's goat? Well, I didn't necessarily apply to get Blake's goat. I applied because I needed a job, but I did. I was aware that 
it would probably annoy Blake, but at that point I didn't really care. And, you know, I need to make money somehow. You had previously signed a confidentiality agreement with Lush. Yeah. I mean, that had been so long ago. I barely remembered, but yeah, yeah, I did. You broke this agreement. Yeah. Which was wrong of me, but honestly, at the moment, I felt as though if I was such a bad employee, I didn't realize, I, I didn't see why Lush should be so concerned with me going to work somewhere else. Suddenly Terrace Greenery created a, a compound very similar to Drufo. Um, yeah. So to reiterate, after you broke this confidentiality agreement, Terrace Greenery created a, a compound very similar to Drupo. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like there's an iPhone, there's a Samsung. I feel like top of the line products are normally pretty similar to each other, but yeah. No further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Uh, yes, briefly. <clears throat> Mr. Durst, um, what, or was it in your job description to do anything but research? No, no, it was not. So you, it wasn't in your job description to bring your concerns to uh, Blake Doncourt, for example? Um, no, it was actually Jerry's job, job description to see the research I was conducting, so. Thank you, I have no further questions. Thank you, counsel, may this witness be excused. Yes, your honor. And do the plaintiffs have any other witnesses they'd like to call? Yes, Your Honor, the plaintiff would like to call Dr. Casey Rogers to the stand. Could you please state your name for the record? My name is Dr. Casey Rogers. Now you say you're a doctor. Are you a medical doctor? No, my PhD is in agriculture and entomology. What do you do for a living? I'm a professor in the horticulture and entomology department at University of California, Berkeley. What degrees do you hold? Well, I have that PhD in agriculture and entomology from UC Berkeley. And then I also have a bachelor of science in agriculture and chemistry from CSU. What kind of research did you do to get your PhD? Well, before my PhD, I worked as a research analyst for a large multinational chemical company. And after I got my PhD, I've published many scholarly articles about the effects of exposure to chemicals, which includes Drufo. Your Honor, let the record reflect that I am asking a, the witness and opposing counsel to look at copies of what has previously been marked as Exhibit 6 and 7. Dr. Rogers, do you recognize Exhibit 6? Yes, it's a copy of my cur curriculum vitae, which just shows my educational and professional work background. Who prepared this document? I did. Does this document accurately show your education and qualifications? It does. You have to show it off somehow. Is it common practice to make a CV if you've graduated from a master's program or if you work as a professor at an academic institution? It is. Your Honor, at this time, I move for the admission of Exhibit 6. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 6 shall be admitted. So as outlined in Exhibit 6, what are you currently researching? Well, I'm working in the Environmental Chemistry and Toxicology Laboratory at UC Berkeley, and a lot of my research is important to minimizing the hazards of pesticide exposure for humans. And now, do you recognize Exhibit 7? Yes, it's a copy of my research publications. Is this a fair and accurate copy of your publications in this field? It is. Who prepared this document? I did. Is it common practice to make a list of research publications? It is. Your Honor, at this time, I move for the admission of Exhibit 7. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 7 shall be admitted. What's the main focus of your research publications? Well, in the last nine years, I've had four research publications on Drufo, which includes my own study on Drufo. So I'd say recently my main focus has been Drufo. How has your research been used? It's used in two ways. It's used in litigation and administrative advisory boards, although this is my first time personally testifying. And then it's also used in recommendations to companies for how they should best handle their product and how they should recommend their customers handle the product. 
Your Honor, at this time, I move to qualify Dr. Rogers as an expert in the fields of environmental chemistry and toxicology. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. All issues with this witness's expertise will be addressed on cross. Any uh, request of voir dire this witness? Uh, no, Your Honor, not at this time. Uh, this witness shall be admitted as a expert in environmental chemistry and toxicology. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Rogers, what motivated you to study Drufo? Well, after Drufo was initially released on the market, I read reports of potential negative side effects, and I wasn't aware of any sufficient studies on its safety. And then after learning that Drufo was carcinogenic in rats, I wanted to investigate the effects on humans. How did you examine Drufo after learning that it's carcinogenic in rats? I conducted my own study on long-term health effects of exposure to Drufo. How did you conduct your study? I observed and compared three groups of people over multiple years. The first group was my control group, those who had never been exposed to Drufo. The second group were people who were exposed to Drufo on occasion. And then the third group were people who were exposed to Drufo on a regular, almost daily basis. Why did you have a control group? A control group is helpful in situations like these, just so we can really take one variable, change that variable, and then compare it against uh, people who uh, were never affected by that variable. Did you find a connection between Drufo and cancer development? I did. In my study, those who had higher levels of exposure to Drufo also had a higher incident, uh, incidences of developing cancer later on in life. According to your study, how much does Drufo increase the likelihood of humans developing cancer? Well, those in my third group of the study, uh, those with prolonged exposure, they were 10 times more likely to be diagnosed with cancer as those with no exposure to Drufo. And they were five times more likely to be diagnosed with cancer as those with occasional exposure. So those in my second group. As we know, the plaintiff has been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Did you find any incidences of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in your study? I did. Uh, the majority of cancers that people were diagnosed with in my study were endocrine and exocrine-based varieties and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is an exocrine-based variety of cancer, and we did find specific instances of non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma in my study. How does non-Hodgkin's lymphoma relate to environmental toxicology? Well, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma isn't inherited genetically. It's usually caused by environmental factors, which includes exposure to pesticides, which is kind of where my work comes into it as a toxicologist. Um, the toxins and pesticides can be absorbed to the skin or more dangerously inhaled. How do your findings relate to the plaintiff, Dakota Weirs? Well, I reviewed uh, Dakota Weirs' medical and employment records, and Ms. Weirs was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We also know that Weirs did not use any protective gear um, while handling lush fertilizer products for a prolonged period of time. And we also know that all lush fertilizer products sold in the United States contain Drufo. Where would Ms. Weirs fit into your study? Well, if we recall the three groups, the first group was my control group, those who had never been exposed to Drufo, and Ms. Spears definitely doesn't fit into that group. The second group were those who were occasionally exposed to Drufo, but Ms. Weirs' level of exposure would put her into the third group of my study, those who were exposed on a regular, almost daily basis. That same group that in my study had a 10 times greater chance of developing cancer than those with no exposure to Drufo. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor, but before I begin, could I just get a time check? You have seven minutes and 28 seconds left on the cross. Perfect, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Dr. Rogers. You have a degree in agriculture and entomology, correct? That's right. And in essence, agriculture is the practice of cultivating plants and livestock? Yes, that's right. And entomology is the study of bugs. Do I have that correct? Yes. You have no formal degree in toxicology, right? I don't. They're all kind of related. Right, but you're not a medical doctor. Is that correct? No, I'm not a medical doctor. And this is your first time testifying as an expert witness, yes? That's right, although um, my studies have been used um, in court before. Right, but you stated in your statement that it hopefully won't be your last time 
testifying as an expert witness? Yeah, I, I hope that we can continue to bring light to the problems that Drufo causes. Right, and you wanna be on the forefront of the battle, correct? Yes. You study the potentially harmful effects of prolonged exposure to chemicals on the body, right? That's right. And one of these chemicals you studied was Drufo, yes? Yes. In order to do this, you conducted a study, correct? I did. Yet, nowhere in your statement do you say that this study was peer-reviewed, right? It wasn't peer-reviewed. Right. You also say it was not duplicated? It wasn't duplicated, although I hope it will be in the future to really get more and more accurate data on the dangers of Drufo. Right. And this study was results, or this study was geared solely towards one environmental factor being Drufo, right? Yes, that was the variable that we were looking at. Right, but you failed to look at any other environmental factors that could have led to um, your results, correct? Uh, I didn't need to, I was just studying Drufo. Right, moving on, you say part of your study was inconclusive, yes? Yes, the part about uh, how to best protect against Drufo. Right, and you would say learning how to best protect yourself from something you deem carcinogenic would be something important to find out, correct? Yes, and once again, I hope to do more studies about this in the future. My work here is not done, um, but the study that I have conducted uh, wasn't conclusive. Right, because you haven't found time yet to replicate this crucial aspect of the study, right? Uh, that's right. It's not the main point of my study, but um, yeah, I, I hope to do more research about it later. So you can't confirm the efficacy of these products as of right now, but you still crafted multiple safety recommendations. Is that correct? I am aware of the general safety recommendations um, for handle handling fertilizers and uh, toxins. And one of these was long sleeves, correct? Yes. And long pants? Yes. And a medical grade protective mask that covers the mouth and nose, correct? Yes, generally for handling toxins, the best way to prevent the ingestion of these toxins into your body is by um, covering your skin and covering your mouth. Although I can't say what's the best uh, protective measure for Drufo specifically, because as I said, my study was inconclusive. Right, but in your statement, you say Dakota was exposed to this chemical without the use of any of this protective gear that you previously recommended, correct? That's so she neglected to use any of this gear? She, no, she was not using long, long pants, long sleeves or a mask. Your claim today is that Drufo is linked to cancer, yes? Yes, according to my study. Right, and this claim was based on your study, which was not peer reviewed for accuracy. That's right, and once again, I, I hope it will be in the future because this is clearly a dangerous chemical. Yes, and your claim that is dangerous is based on a study that was not duplicated, again, for accuracy. It has not been duplicated. And this claim is made on a study that you stated was partially inconclusive, yes? Yes, on uh, how to best protect against um, Drufo specifically. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. No further questions. Can you redirect? Yes, Your Honor. And so, sorry, um, was there any reason for Ms. Weirs to use protection um, when you think of the label in Exhibit 1? Uh, the label only says that um, eye irritation was, um, was possible. It doesn't warn against cancer. Um, I, I can't blame Ms. Weirs for, um, for wanting to feel the breeze on her face. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. At this time, the plaintiff rests. Thank you. Uh, does the defense have any witnesses that they would like to present? Yes, Your Honor. The defense would like to call Dr. Devin Williams to the stand. May I proceed, Your Honor? Please. Good morning, Dr. Devin Williams. Could you please state your name and spell your last for the record? Good evening. My name is Dr. Devin Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. And what is your current occupation? I currently lead the um, toxicology research and development labs at Lush, as well as I'm the outgoing chair of the company's ethic committee. How long have you been working at Lush Fertilizer? I've been working with Lush for nearly a decade now and have been leading the labs for seven years. 
And what does your job position require you to do? I largely oversee all the environmental impacts of our products. However, I see myself as having an inherent responsibility to always consider the whys and ifs beyond my immediate project objectives. And what scientific skills do you have? Through my training experience, I understand how to evaluate and research test results to determine the fate of potentially toxic chemical agents. With this, I am able to um, identify any harms and how to neutralize that harm if it does happen. Did you receive a degree in toxicology? Yes, I have received a PhD in pharmacology as well as toxicology at CSU. Did you receive any other degrees? Uh, yes, I have also received a post PhD program in pharma toxicology, as well as a master's degree in forensic toxicology. Your Honor, based on this witness's extensive experience, training, and certification, we move to enter Dr. Devin Williams as an expert in pharmatoxicology, the negative effects of DRUFO, and forensic toxicology pursuant to Rule 702. Any voir dire or objection? Yes, Your Honor. Permission to perform a voir dire? Sure. Dr. Williams, you haven't published any articles on the toxicological effects of DRUFO, correct? Um, that is not within my witness statement. Would you like me to answer? To the best of your knowledge. Um, I did not mention any such in my uh, personal witness statement, however I may have. Forensic toxicology and pharmacology both have a specific emphasis on the study of drugs, correct? Yes, however, it also extends to the nature of chemicals. And DRUFO is not a drug, right? No, but it is a chemical. You haven't done any personal research on the toxicological effects of DRUFO, correct? That's, I don't believe that's in my witness statement. Would you like me to answer? To the best of your knowledge, you, you haven't done your own study on the toxicological effects of DRUFO. You've simply looked at data. I have not conducted any personal um, studies on the potentially harmful effects of DRUFO. However, I do know that um, how DRUFO works and its chemical processes through data, yes, and I know how it works. But you don't have any special expertise regarding DRUFO because you haven't written any articles or done your own research on DRUFO, right? However, I've worked with DRUFO um, and our product for seven years now and been working with Lush for multiple years. So I have a lot of experience with it. Your Honor, I don't object to this witness being qualified in the fields of clinical and forensic toxicology and pharmacology but I do object to qualifying this witness as an expert to testify on the toxicological effects of DRUFO as they have not done any research outside of the company. Response? Of course, Your Honor. For a witness to be qualified as an expert, they must have one of the five categories, knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. You've just heard this witness say that it, she has tons of experience in the, with the negative, negative effects of DRUFO. She leads the research and um, she leads the re toxicology research and development labs at Lush. It is her job to know whether DRUFO is safe. So she would therefore know the negative effects. I will say that I did hear a lot of testimony about this witness's um, background and specialized knowledge and training in pharma toxicology and forensic toxicology um, as to the uh, effects themselves of DRUFO specifically. Um, I will uh, allow the uh, defense to uh, try to ask a few more questions to lay that foundation. At this time, I am going to um, allow for this witness to be tendered as an expert in forensic uh, toxicology, pharmatoxicology, but not of the effects of DRUFO. Okay. Um. Ms. Williams, can you please repeat your occupation? Um, my job occupation at Lush, I largely, I lead all the lab, all the toxicology labs, um, which are the research and development labs. And I am again, a part of the company's, I'm the outgoing chair of the company's at the committee. And what do you research at Lush? I research any um, potential side effects or how our chemicals work in our products. Um, with this, since I am the head, it is implied that I do do research for all of our chemicals, including Drufo. Thank you. We now move to enter the witness, 
um, in uh, the negative effects of DRUPO pursuant to Rule 702? And just within that scope of those additional questions, does the uh, plaintiff's counsel have any additional voir dire or objection? No, Your Honor, I stand by my objection. Um, at this time, I am going to allow this witness to be tendered as an expert in uh, the effects of DRUFO. Um, I, I just will clarify that counsel said negative effects. Initially, it was just effects. Uh, Your Honor, we'll enter in just the effects of DRUFO. All right. All right. Thank you. What is DRUFO? Uh, overall, Drufo is a new revolutionary chemical that binds all the ingredients in our fertilizer. And I am aware that I'm here today due to the fact there's a belief that Drufo could cause cancer. And why was it created? Drufo was originally created because it um, straddles both mods of how fertilizer enhances the growth in plants. One of those by being it adds nutrients, as well as it improves the effectiveness of the soil by modifying its water retention and aeration. Both of these things do affect environmental balances. In your statement, you call Drufo a revolutionary product. Why is that? Well, Drufo truly is a revolutionary product, mostly due to the fact it does not contribute to nitrate pollution. Many mid 20th century fertilizers focus on nitrogen fixing chemical processes. However, this was deemed as problematic since we later discovered it uh, contributes to a process known as eutrophication. And what is eutrophication? Eutrophication is when there's a buildup of excess nutrients, which is typically um, created by too many nitrates. And these uh, excess nutrients then accumulate in various bodies of water, which is deemed harmful. And what are some of the harmful effects of eutrophication? In short, eutrophication can kill off our fish as well as make water um, toxicated and unsuitable for consumption by humans. Basically, these excess nutrients. Um, denses algae blooms, then which leads to densing the oxygen level, killing off the fish. And these algae blooms can harbor bacteria that makes it harmful for humans. Is it true that Drupo is banned in the EU? Yes, this is true. Did this decision consider cancer risk? The reasons the EU had ultimately decided to ban Drupo wasn't for cancer-related issues at all. Under the European Union's Nigate Directive, no new fertilizer may be used that contribute to more than incidental nitrate accumulation in lab tests. Drufo um, heavily reduces the amount of nitrates in nature, which is why it doesn't contribute to nitrate pollution, but it still does contain some nitrogens. So the EU prohibits the use of any fertilizer that contains any amount of nitrogen in it because it does so under unrealistic laboratory conditions. So do you believe that the Europeans ban on Drufo is valid? No, I personally don't, because again, Drupa doesn't contribute to nitrate pollution. Lush, we do plan on submitting our findings to the EU once we finish all the conclusions on our labs. Can you talk about the tests that can be done to determine if Drupa can cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Of course. One uh, key factor to ensure that Drupa doesn't cause non-Hodgkin lymphoma is to look at the statistics. If you take any group or number of people, um, despite their environmental differences or similarities, a certain number of them will uh, um, develop non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. However, in order to reduce this random element, you should look at farm laborers who use fertilizers versus farm laborers who use fertilizers with Drufo. And with this, there is not a significant increase in the percentage of Drufo causing non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Have you reviewed uh, Casey Rogers' study? I have, and I personally find uh, Dr. Rogers' study was a fluke. Can you explain your analogy, apples to oranges? Of course. I had compared uh, farm laborers who use fertilizers to farm laborers who use fertilizers with Drufo when seeing the comparison or the correlation between Drufo and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, or apples to apples. However, Rogers' study had compared casual gardeners to farm laborers who used a wide variety of fertilizers. With this, it's hard to pin down to it being Drufo as the cause or comparing, you know, apples to oranges. What were the results of Casey Rogers' study? Uh, her results had concluded that there was a correlation between non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Drufo. However, this study wasn't a clean and thorough study. A valid study would need um, a comparison to farm laborers who use 
a variety of fertilizers to farm laborers who use fertilizers with Drufo in them. Were there any possible errors with the procedure of the study? Yes, I do believe there are multiple errors in her study. One being she had compared apples to oranges and another one being even if we had compared the um, use of fertilizers with Drufo versus the fertilizers without Drufo, it still doesn't completely eliminate the random element. And also, Dr. Rogers' study has never been peer reviewed and also has, most importantly, never been replicated. Has there been a significant increase in the incidence of non Hodgkin's lymphoma since the creation of Drufo? Um, no, there has been no correlation from Drufo to non Hodgkin lymphoma. And simply put, Drufo doesn't cause cancer. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Cross examination. Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Williams, you've led the toxicology research and development labs at, for seven years, correct? Yes, this is true. So for the last seven years, it's been your job to make sure lush fertilizer is safe for the public to use. Yes, this is true as well, that it's environmentally friendly. If lush fertilizer was proven to be unsafe, it would have been under your watch. Yes, but it hasn't really been proven that it's been unsafe. You're being paid by Lush to testify today, right? As many people here today are being paid, that is true. And like you said, Drufo is banned in the EU, correct? For nothing cancer related, yes. And you said that Lush plans to submit findings for reconsideration of EU approval, right? Yes, this is true. Once we finish up the conclusions on all of our labs. You admit that this lawsuit could change that. Of course, I'm pretty sure any company that's been falsely accused of it being carcinogenic would face this. And in fact, you state, if a U.S. court were to find that Drufo causes cancer, that would create a whole host of new bureaucratic roadblocks with the EU. Of course, again, as really any company would face if they were being falsely accused of something such as this. So because you work for Lush and because Lush hopes to sell their fertilizer with Drufo in the EU, you have a financial interest in this lawsuit, right? Again, as many others do too, but yes. And now you criticize Dr. Rogers for comparing the exposure of Drufo for farm laborers, casual gardeners, and people who didn't do either of those things, right? Right. Their study didn't make it any easy way to pin it down to Drufo being the cause if there was a correlation to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. You stated that a valid study would need to compare farm laborers who use Drufo to those who use fertilizers without Drufo, correct? This is correct. However, you yourself never did a study to compare these groups of farm laborers. That is not within my witness statement. Would you like me to answer? Yes. I had mentioned the statistical test. Uh, it is unclear if I had conducted that study myself. However, this uh, statistical test shows that there is no correlation from Drufo to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And now you never explained the studies that Lush did to come to your conclusions, right? Aside from looking at statistics. I never go into details about them now. You never told us the sample size yet Lush used in their studies. No, however, we did do them, do them. You never told us how long Lush studied people who use fertilizers. No, but again, this is all to be expected that we did that and we did. You never told us what variables Lush controlled for. No, I did not. So the jury has no way of understanding how reliable your conclusions are because you haven't adequately explained Lush's research. I have not, but again, it is implied and we've never seen anything suggesting that Drufo is carcinogenic, or at least I personally have not. You stated Lush's CEO, Blake Doncourt, needed you to keep Drufo products, quote, industry leading, environmentally aware and cost effective, right? These are some of the things, yes. And again, I do see myself as going beyond my immediate project objectives. So of course, I also consider the fact that Drupo is safe or not. But you didn't state that one of these priorities was the health of Lush's customers. I did say that it, these three things uh, provide a benefit for us as well as our consumers. Okay, thank you, Dr. Williams. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Can you redirect? No, I don't believe it's necessary. All right, may this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Does the defense have any other witnesses they'd like to call? Yes, Your Honor, the defense calls Ms. Skyler Rears to the stand.
Good afternoon, Ms. Weirs. Could you please state your name and spell your last for the record? Good afternoon. My name is Skylar Weirs, W-E-I-R-S. Thank you, Ms. Weirs. Are you currently employed? Yes, I am. What's your profession? I'm an investigative journalist for The Rationalist Magazine. And can you tell us all what The Rationalist Magazine is? Yes, The Rationalist is a science, education, and advocacy magazine published by the Rationalist Society, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to, devoted to stopping the spread of pseudoscience. Um, basically, as our magazine, um, our main goal is for our readers to ask intelligent questions. And what kind of material do you write for The Rationalist? Um, well, I write on a variety of subjects, but lately I've been writing a lot on commercial agri agriculture and modern agritech, um, which has been super interesting. Can you tell me more about your background with modern agritech and commercial agriculture? Um, yes, my editor picked me to write a series on modern agritech. Um, and as part of that series, I wrote an article questioning the link between Drufo and cancer. And Ms. Weirs, what did you do to prepare to write these articles? Well, I spent almost a year reading and researching. Um, I went through a bunch of articles, all from various agritech companies. Um, from there, I looked at the publications referenced in those articles and went through those and studied them as well. Wow, did you do anything further? Yes, I also maintained a wealth of information from the United States Department of Agriculture, as well as the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. And do you believe all this research gave you a good foundation to start writing your articles? Um, yes, absolutely. My knowledge base includes not only general knowledge, but also statistical and historical information. Um, in fact, outside of the USDA and NASDA, I doubt many people really over have the overall perspective on modern agritech as I do. Your Honor, I'd like to offer Skylar Weirs as an expert in modern agritech pursuit to rule 702. Any voir dire or objection? Permission for a brief voir dire, Your Honor? Certainly. Ms. Weirs, to get a medical degree, you have to receive a four-year undergraduate degree, right? Um, correct. I, I do not have a medical degree. Study four years in med school. Correct. Objection? Okay. Relevance? Your Honor, this is relevant as it goes to the witnesses' lack of experience in the field of agritech and failure to spend considerable time researching Drufo. I'm going to overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you like me to repeat the question? Um, yes, please. And complete a four-year residency? Correct. So that would be at least 12 years of training after high school? Yes, that's correct. But Ms. Weirs, you only studied Drufo for one year. Um, yes, I did very extensive research on Drufo, however. But during that year, you read articles? Um, I read, yes, I read a lot of articles. But you didn't do any work in the field of agritech? Um, no, my job is I'm a researcher. So you've never even worked with these products that you're testifying about then either? Um, no, however, again, I spent a year reading and researching about them. All of your knowledge, then, about Drufo comes from reading articles that someone else researched and published. Um, correct. Articles by various agritech companies, as, one, as well as some from very high-tier organizations, such as the United States Department of Agriculture and the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. Thank you. Your Honor, well, the witnesses established that they've reviewed publications and information maintained by the USDA and NASDA regarding agritech. The witness has failed to prove that they spent considerable time researching Drufo, as a single year is not sufficient to fully qualify this witness as an expert. Therefore, while I do not object to Ms. Weir's being qualified in the field of agritech, I do object to any expert opinion testimony about Drufo or its effects. Response? Yes, Your Honor. I believe um, according to Rule 702, my witness only needs one of the five factors listed, which is knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. And we have established that she has training in um, modern agritech, which includes more recently Drufo, as she's written articles about this. Um, and this is her entire job. Therefore, she has both knowledge and semi-experience as she's been writing for this. 
At this time, I will allow the uh, expert or the witness to be tendered as an expert in agritech. Um, and I will allow the defense to ask a few more questions to attempt to lay foundation for any qualifications this witness might have to be an expert in uh, the effects of Drufo. In your research, do you come across any specific chemical fertilizers or chemical compounds? Um, yes, I did. In Lush Fertilizer, I spent a lot of time researching Drufo, and I even wrote an article on Drufo that was published. Your Honor, I readmit this uh, expert witness in modern agrotech with an uh, emphasis on research in Drufo. And just based on that uh, recent line of questioning, does the plaintiff's counsel have any voir dire objections? Your Honor, I stand by my objection as one article connected to cancer is not sufficient to qualify this expert. And at this time, I am going to uh, allow this expert to be, uh, or the, allow this witness to be tendered as an expert um, in all the proffered areas uh, that the defense has said, including agritecture, modern agritecture, um, with an emphasis on chemical effects of Drupal. Ms. Weirs, can you tell us what Drufo is? Um, yes, Drufo is a compound in lush fertilizer, um, which is really revolutionary for both the environment and the users of the product. Um, it's an incredibly effective bonding agent, meaning that a significantly smaller amount of the fertilizer needs to be applied. Um, and this is really good for the environment as it prevents nitrate contamination um, in groundwater and waterways. And have you heard the claim that Drufo causes cancers like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yes, I have. Do you agree with this claim? Um, no, I do not. In my extensive research um, from various agritech companies with many different opinions, as well as the USDA and NASDA, um, I have not come across any credible, credible studies linking Drufo and cancer. And in all of your research, are there any gardening substances that have been previously linked to cancer? Um, yes, there is a much clearer link between other pesticides and cancer. Um, there's a lot of pesticides on the market that contain active ingredients that Lush doesn't. Um, one of these being arsenic, which is classified as a known carcinogen, and one of them being glyphosate, which is classified as a probable carcinogen. So these would have a much clearer link to cancer. Moving on, Ms. Weirs, what do you like to do for fun? Well, like a lot of people my age, I love to watch sports and I get super into them. Um, okay. I've even... Relevance? Response? If you would have allowed my witness um, to finish, she was, this goes to the financial bias or lack thereof of my witness. Uh, can counsel make an offer of proof of what this witness is about to testify to? Uh, yes, after I was going to address her gambling um, in the past. I will overrule the objection at this time. Um, anyways, as I was saying, um, I've even dabbled in a little bit of sports betting and gambling. If your twin Dakota doesn't receive the settlement today, how will this affect you? It would actually harm me financially. And how would this harm you financially? Well, as far as I know, I have not been written out of my father's will. And if Dakota does not receive this settlement, uh, my father has, of course, already agreed to shoulder her medical costs, technically leaving me less money in the long run. And how does it feel to be testifying against your twin Dakota? I mean, I don't even like to think of it that way. Not only are we family, but we're twins. I really wish I could stand by Dakota in this lawsuit. Um, but my research has demonstrated to me that Drufo is not a carcinogen. Um, I want justice for Dakota just as much as the rest of my family. I just want her to get the right company. And Ms. Weirs, why are you here testifying today? Um, I'm here because I stand by my research, research that I started before Dakota's diagnosis. Um, I'm confident that Drufo could be a game changer in modern agritech as a safe alternative to currently used fertilizers. And why do you believe so strongly in Drufo and Lush? Um, well, Lush is an incredibly ethical fertilizer company. 
Um, I initially started researching because of their commitment to donate 10% of their annual profits towards reducing nitrate con contamination. Um, but from there, what really impressed me about the company was just how much of a safer product they are than other commercial pesticides on the market. And based on your expertise in modern agritech and your research of Drufo, do you think it or any Lush products could have caused a cancer like non-Hodgkin lymphoma? Um, I do not. My extensive research has demonstrated that Drufo is not a carcinogen. Um, I heard Dakota testify today that she used many different fertilizers while working at Haven. Um, and these fer other fertilizers that she, that she used could have contained known carcinogens and probable carcinogens, which would have a much clearer link to this disease. And you heard Dakota testify today that she didn't wear protective gear. Yes, additionally, protective gear is important when working with any chemicals. And since you lived with Dakota and, you know, she's your twin, why do you think Dakota didn't wear protective gear? Well, I hate to point fingers, but ultimately... Projection speculation. I will sustain the objection at this time, but I will allow counsel to ask a, a few other questions to lay the foundation of this witness's personal knowledge um, of the uh, mental state of Ms. Weirs, Ms. Dakota Weirs. You lived with Dakota for all of your adolescent life, correct? That's correct. And you did really similar activities, except you did really similar activities. Correct. Correct. And when you lived, she, uh, yes. And since you lived with Dakota at the time and you started to hear about her work experiences, why do you think she didn't wear protective gear at work? Um, well, ultimately, ultimately, I think it's an issue of poor training by Haven Landscaping. Um, no employer should allow its teenage workers to work with any chemicals, even safer ones such as Drufo, without ensuring that they're wearing proper protective gear. Um, again, I want justice for Dakota just as much as everyone here and everyone in my family. Dakota just has the wrong defendant. Thank you, Ms. Weirs. No further questions. Examination. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Weirs. Today I'm going to ask you a few questions. Ms. Weirs, you're testifying against your twin, Dakota, Dakota Weirs, correct? That's correct. But you and Dakota don't necessarily have the best relationship, do you? Um, I wouldn't say we have a bad relationship, but we didn't really have the stereotypical twin relationship. Well, after Dakota got cancer, your family had to pay for the medical bills, right? Yes. And they were pretty expensive, weren't they? Yes. So expensive that your parents could no longer support you financially. Um, that's correct. Her yeah. medical bills came first, of course. You're a gambler as well, right? Um, admittedly, yes, I'm a bit of a sports gambler. So specifically, your parents couldn't pay off your gambling debt anymore. Yeah, either. again, of course, my sister's medical bills came before that. That must have been pretty hard for you financially then. Um, I was in a bit of a pit. However, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I'm working my own jobs to get out of it. So hard, in fact, that you had to get a second job as a server at Applebee's to make ends meet. Um, yes, that's correct. So you resent Dakota for using up your father's money when you had debts of your own from your gambling addiction? No, I absolutely do not resent my twin for developing cancer or any of the costs that would come along with that. Absolutely not. Well, you are here testifying today against Dakota, right? Yes, and I wish I wasn't, but my research tells me that Drufo did not give her cancer. Thank you. Now, let's talk about your experience researching Drufo. Ms. Weirs, as we previously established, you only studied Drufo for one year? Yeah, I'd say a, a year is pretty a long time to be studying one thing. And during that year, you only wrote one article about Drufo and cancer. Um, yeah, to write an article and get it published, it takes time. But generally, as an investigative journalist, you write articles about pseudoscientific hit jobs? Um, correct. And you claim that these hit jobs are financially motivated? That's correct. 
One example you gave of this was how Monsanto utilized GMOs to monopolize the commercial maize market and was then sabotaged by its competitors. That's correct. Relevance. Months? Your Honor, this is relevant as it goes to the connection between GMOs and the example that Ms. Weirs provided to Drufo and how the examples she provided as to why Drufo does not cause cancer may be inaccurate. We now overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you like me to repeat the question? Um, yes, please. One example you gave of this was how Monsanto utilized GMOs to monopolize the commercial maize market and was then sabotaged by its competitors. Yes, that's correct. And its competitors did so by attacking GMOs. Um, yes, that's correct. You provided this example to suggest the same thing is happening with Drufo. Correct. So your argument is that the claims saying Drufo causes cancer are rooted in finance rather than scientific motives. Correct. But Drufo is not a GMO, is it? Um, no, I wasn't so much as comparing Drufo to GMOs. I was more comparing um, what can happen with businesses um, in the agritech community when someone comes out with such a revolutionary product. And there's no evidence that Drufo is being financially attacked, though, is there? There's not evidence. However, it is a common thing that can happen in the agritech community. So there's no indication that these same financial motives used by competitors using GMO are in play with respect to Drufo then? Um, well, like I was saying, it's just something that happens in the agri-tech community when someone comes up with a really um, advanced product. However, the only example you provided of this financial motivation over science was with GMOs, correct? Um, yes, I was just aiming to offer something to compare it to. That's yes. already happened. You published an article saying Drufo doesn't cause cancer. Correct. So your reputation as a journalist relies on your claim that Drufo is safe. Um, no, I would not say that. The findings in my articles are not my own scientific findings. They're the scientific findings of various agritech co companies as well as the USDA and NISDA. So no, I would not say my reputation would be on the line in any way. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. And the, does the defense have any other witnesses they'd like to call? Yes, Your Honor, the defense calls Ms. Blake Doncourt to the stand. All right. Good afternoon, Ms. Doncourt. Could you please state your name and spell your last for the record? Good afternoon, my name is Blake Doncourt. That's D-O-N-C-O-U-R-T-T. -T. Ms. Doncourt, what is your current occupation? Yes, I'm currently the CEO of Lush Fertilizer Incorporated. Do you have a lot of experience in the fertilizer industry? I do, yeah. Um, I've been growing my company for over 20 years now and I'm very proud of the work we do. Would you inform the jury of your relationship to today's case? Yes, um, I'm here because I'm being wrongfully accused of ignoring a carcinogen in our fertilizer. Like I said, I've grown Lush from the ground up and would never do anything to harm our customers. Could you tell us a little bit about your product? Yes, yeah, so Lush Fertilizer is our flagship product and it is known to produce vibrant green grass for our customers. What would you say makes Lush Fertilizer different from other fertilizers? Well, our fertilizer is unique because it contains an ingredient called Drufo. What is Drufo? Yeah, so Drufo is a chemical that can help to reduce nitrogen buildup in the environment. Um, environmentalism really is a key value to both myself and Lush, and we pride ourselves on the work we do to protect our environment. Um, I, I do understand that Dakota believes that Drufo caused her cancer, but the studies conducted by Lush's team um, did not find any risks associated with Drufo. Have have there, enter, have there ever been any studies that found risks associated with Drufo? Uh, no, there have not been. The only study that ever seemed to find any kind of potential risk associated with the use of Drufo was this one that um, Casey Rogers mentioned earlier today. Honestly, it seems like the first time anybody even heard of the study was in this current litigation. 
Had you heard of this study before this lawsuit? Uh, no, I had not. So, Ms. Doncourt, did Lush test Drufo before putting it on the market? Yes, we absolutely did. Lush's Toxicology Research and Development Lab did very extensive research and testing before even considering putting our product on the market. Um, our lab, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency, did not identify Drufo as a specific risk to people coming into contact with the fertilizer. Ms. Doncourt, what is your relationship to Carson Durst? Yes, so Carson was a close family friend. Uh, he grew up with my son and they were best friends. I actually ended up giving Carson a job at Lush right out of college. What was Carson's job at Lush? Yes, so Carson worked for the research and development team. His job was to look for any dangers or risks associated with using our products so that we could ultimately follow up on these concerns. If Carson found anything at all, his job is to immediately bring these concerns to Lush's attention. Does Carson still work at Lush? Uh, no, he does not. Unfortunately, Carson's performance at Lush was so poor that we had to fire him. Honestly, it was pretty upsetting for me because I really did stick my neck out um, and overlooked qualified applicants to give Carson a job um, just, just for him to let me down. So back when Carson was working at Lush, did Carson ever express any concerns about any of Lush's products? Yeah, um, he did not. So it was not actually until after we fired Carson that he suddenly began making these claims about Lush hiding data that identified Drufo as a carcinogen. Honestly, if Carson really believed all of that, I feel like he should have brought that up when he was working at Lush. That was his job after all. Was Carson the only researcher to assert these type of claims? Yes, um, absolutely. As you did hear Dr. Devin Williams testify today, our labs did not identify Drufo as a potential carcinogen. Ms. Doncourt, were there any kind of specific claims that Carson made? Yeah, so there was this email um, that Carson seemed to come up with. Um, yeah. Your Honor, permission for my co-counsel to screen share what has previously been entered as Exhibit 4? That's fine. Ms. Doncourt, is this the email you're referring to that Carson seemed to have come up with? Um, yes, this is. And do you know what this email is? Uh, no, I don't. Like I said, I did hear Carson talk about this email and I see that I'm listed as a recipient, but I have never seen this email before this uh, lawsuit. Did authorities search Lush's computer? Yes, they did. That was, yes, that was something they did. And in that search, did authorities find this email anywhere on Lush's computers? No, they absolutely did not. And like I said, I really have no idea where Carson came up with this. So Ms. Doncourt, let's say you had received this email. What would you have done? Yeah, so I can see that this email seems to state that there's concerns arising around potential carcinogens and Trust me, if I would have received this email, our products would not be on the market today, especially with not without very, very substantial warning labels. My co-counsel can stop sharing this email now. Ms. Doncourt, what did Carson do after you had to fire him? Yeah, so Carson went to go work for Terra Greenery, um, who is actually our biggest competitor. And this was in violation of our non-compete and non-disclosure agreements that Carson had signed. Um, Carson went and worked for Terra knowing exactly how we make our fertilizer. And soon after I heard that Terra was going to make a product rather similar to ours. Um, after all this, I honestly just don't feel like I can trust Carson anymore. Ms. Doncourt, is there anything else you could have done to ensure the safety of less fertilizer? Right, so there is a process called baking, which can in some cases help to eliminate any potential risks in a product. However, based on my team's extensive analysis, it would not have made any difference in Drufo's safety. And did you and your research teams find any risks associated with the product? No, uh, we did not find any risks associated with the use of Lush fertilizer. If we would have, we would have absolutely put those risks on the product's warning label. Yet again, because we do care so deeply about our consumers, we still put labels with extensive safety recommendations on all of our products. Ms. Doncourt, finally, do you believe that Lush fertilizer caused Ms. Weir's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Uh, no, 
I absolutely do not. We did all of the necessary research at Lush, and our studies found absolutely no link between Lush fertilizer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lush would never do anything to cause harm to the environment or to human health, and we really do consider ourselves stewards of good environmental and safety practices. I, I truly do hope that Dakota recovers soon, but I sleep just fine at night knowing that no Lush product contributed to uh, Dakota's condition. Thank you, Ms. Doncourt. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Last examination. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to be asking you some questions about the testimony here today. Um, to begin, we heard testimony that you donate 10% of your profits to charity, correct? That's true. Like I said, we really do consider environmentalism to be very important, and this is reflected in our finances and our products. But Lush itself is not a charity, is it? Uh, no, we are a company, though I will say that a lot of the products we make um, do help to um, protect the environment. It's a privately owned business for profit, correct? Correct. Um, I'm the CEO of Lush Fertilizer. Yeah. Um, and this business has investors. We do have investors, yes. Um, correct. Uh, that you call vultures. Uh, yes, vulture capitalists, as I believe the term for the type inv of investors that Lush had. Uh, they provided our company with seed funds initially. And these vulture investors demand a good return on their investment, correct? Right. They are business people, just like I am. Um, that's part of how the investments work. Correct. And part of giving these vulture investors what they wanted, you need to turn a profit. Um, I would say part of the agreement is, yes, paying back our investors. That's how that works. And part of making a profit is not spending what you deem to be extraneous money. Correct. Uh, sure. Yes. We. Uh, yes. Correct. Like baking Drufo. Um, I would say, like, because our um, labs found that this wasn't necessary, we chose to not bake Drufo. That's correct. Even though baking Drufo would eliminate any risk that your fertilizer was carcinogenic. Once again, our labs didn't find that there was any risk of Drufo being carcinogenic, so it wasn't necessary. Correct. Um, Ms. Doncourt, on line 11, you admit that there was a little risk to um, to not baking Drufo and a little risk is still a risk, is it not? Um, my apologies. Would you like me to refer to my statement um, in front of me or? I'm just um, asking uh, that you, or I'm just pointing out that you did admit that um, a little risk, that Drufo does pose a risk. Um, I believe you're referring to the line that says there's little to no risk. And I'm happy to show you later in my statement where I say that there was no substantial risk um, associated with our product as found by the EPA and our labs. Yes, Ms. Doncourt, but a little risk is still a risk. Uh, once again, I don't believe that we found there specifically to be a small risk, um, but that terminology would be correct, yes. And you did not bake Drufo because it was too expensive. Once again, and because it would not eliminate any, any risk from our product, so that's correct. And the cost of baking Drufo is shown in the table you created? Um, I believe it is, yes, an amortization table. Um, Your Honor, let the record reflect that I'm showing, or I'm asking both opposing counsel and the witness to look at a copy of Exhibit 8. Shall reflect. Uh, do you recognize this exhibit, Ms. Doncourt? Yes, I do. This is, like I mentioned, the table that I made. What is this exhibit? Um, like I said, it's a table, an amortization table I made um, showing uh, profit returns and some various financial details for Lush. And is this a fair and accurate copy of the table you previously mentioned? Yes, it is. At this time, I move for Exhibit 8 to be entered into evidence. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 8 shall be admitted. I would like to talk about your profits associated with baking Drufo. This table that you created shows that you could increase your profits by 6% by not baking Drufo in the first year. Isn't that right? Correct. But just to reiterate, that is not the reason specifically behind not baking Drufo, but you are correct in that reading. And um, so for six pennies for every dollar, you could have baked Drufo. Right. But like I've said, that wasn't necessary based on our lab's analysis and it wouldn't eliminate any risk. 
And based on exhibit eight, your conclusion is that in the following years, baking Drufo would have even less of an impact on your profits. Uh, right. Yes, that's true. There isn't much financial gain. Specifically after the first year, not baking Drufo would only increase your profits by 2%. Uh, yes, it doesn't make a big financial difference. That means just two cents for every dollar you make, you could have baked Drufo. Uh, as you said, yes, that is correct. But there was no reason to, as we didn't find Drufo to be any kind of carcinogenic risk. So for two pennies for every dollar, you could have eliminated any possibility that Drufo could have caused Miss Weirs to have cancer. Um, numbers wise, that's what it would cost to bake. But like I have said, our labs did not find Drufo to be a risk of cancer. And that's why we chose to not bake our fertilizer. But there is risk associated with not baking Drufo. I would not say that, no. I would like to refer you to your witness statement, please, if you have that pulled up. Sure, let me put that in front of me. And starting on line 109 through uh, that sentence, while baking, do you see where I am? Uh, let's see, one moment. Yes, I do. Could you please read that line while starting with while baking through the end of that sentence? Sure. Uh, while baking the fertilizer would remove any risk that our fertilizer was carcinogenic, the baking process was just too expensive for the little risk it alleviated. It's simply overkill. And also, I'm happy to refer you to another line where I say that there was little to no risk with our product, if that would be helpful. Uh, no, I just want to re-ask my question. You do admit that there is little risk to Drufo. In my statement, I believe my wording is little to no risk, so there isn't a proven risk, no. Um, thank you. So in conclusion, baking Drufo was too expensive for your taste. It was too expensive for the uh, small to no amount of risk it would alleviate. That's correct. Even though that small to no risk could have, alleviating that small to no risk could have prevented Dakota Weirs from having cancer. Once again, our labs did not find Drufo to be carcinogenic. Judge, so your honor, human live. I'm sorry, can you repeat your objection? Yes, cumulative. live. We've been on this point for an extensive amount of time. Um, I'm going to overrule the objection at this point, um, but I will encourage counsel to uh, sort of sum up their line of questioning on this particular topic. Would you like me to re-ask my question? Uh, sure, go ahead. So it was too expensive for you to eliminate any risk that Dakota Weir's could have cancer, even though it would have only cost you a couple of pennies for a dollar. As our labs found that Drufo was not a significant risk or any risk of being carcinogenic, baking our products was not necessary. So that's a yes. Yep. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Doncourt, did you find any risk associated with the use of less fertilizer? No, we didn't. And as you heard Dr. Devin Williams testify, our labs did very extensive testing and research to ensure that Drupa was not carcinogenic. So again, why didn't you bake your product? We chose to not bake our products because it would not really eliminate any significant risk as Drufo was not found to be carcinogenic. And were Lush's finances in any way related to your decision to not bake the fertilizer? No, our decision was made based off the fact that it would not um, eliminate any significant risk, and it, so it didn't make sense to spend that money. Thank you, Ms. Doncourt. I have no further questions. Thank you, counsel. May this witness be dismissed? Yes. Uh, does the defense have any other witnesses they'd like to call? No, Your Honor, the defense rests. I believe at this time we are um, ready to proceed to closing arguments. Um, would the uh, plaintiff's counsel like to reserve any time left on their initial closing argument for rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, I would like to reserve any time I have remaining for rebuttal. Great. Um, that is the case. Uh, then you may proceed to your closing argument.
Thank you, Your Honor. Lush prioritized profits over people. Your Honor, members of the jury, Dakota Weir's life has been ruined. All of her hopes and dreams have been snatched away from her. You heard today that Lush could have completely eliminated any risk of giving Dakota cancer by simply baking their fertilizer. Instead, Lush prioritized their profits over the health of their customers. The plaintiff has the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence, meaning that it is more li likely than not that Lush fertilizer, the defendant, was negligent based on four elements. First, we have to prove that Lush manufactured a fertilizer containing Drufo. This element is not in dispute. Second, we had to prove that Lush was negligent by failing to prevent the product from creating an unreasonable risk of harm. Carson Durst testified that Lush knew there was some risk in using their product and that Drufo should be baked to eliminate any safety risks. You heard Blake Doncourt testify that Lush did not bake their fertilizer, even though for just two cents on the dollar, Lush could, could have alleviated all risk of Drufo causing cancer. Lush was prioritizing their profits over their customers. Third, Dakota Weirs had to prove that she was a person th that the defendant should have reasonably expected to use their product. As Dakota Weirs testified, she worked for a landscaping company, meaning that Lush should have expected she would use their product. Fourth, and finally, we had to prove that Dakota Weir's injuries were caused by Lush's negligence. You heard testimony from the plaintiff's expert, Dr. Rogers, that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is caused by environmental factors. It is not genetic. Ms. Weir's testified that she has a twin sister, Skylar, who also testified, testified here today. The only difference the twins had in their upbringing was that Dakota worked as a landscaper and Skylar didn't. As Dr. Rogers showed through her study, exposure to Drufo increases the likelihood of developing cancer tenfold compared to people who have never been exposed to Drufo. The defendant's expert, on the other hand, provided no context as to how they came to the conclusion that there is no correlation between Drufo and cancer. On the issue of whether Lush used reasonable care, the risk of harm was certainly not obvious to Dakota as she thought that the only risk was eye irritation. This belief was based on the label shown in Exhibit 1, which only contained a warning about eye and skin contact. The label for Lush fertilizer was no more stringent than a bottle of shampoo, for example. While she was told by her employer to wear long pants and long sleeves, you heard her testify that no one at Haven Landscaping followed these suggestions. And that's what they were, mere suggestions. Ladies and gentlemen, Lush did not use reasonable care to warn users of the risk of getting cancer because they were prioritizing profits over people. For these reasons, the plaintiff has proved Lush's negligence by a preponderance of the evidence. The defense is now going to ask you to find that Dakota was comparatively negligent, but based on the evidence they presented, they have failed to meet that burden. In order to com prove comparative negligence, they had to show that Dakota Weirs failed to do something that reasonably careful people would do to protect themselves from the claimed danger created by the product. However, it was not reasonable for Dakota Weirs to expect to have to protect herself against cancer when the only claimed danger that Lush informed their customers about was skin and eye irritation. Your Honor, members of the jury, if you find in favor of Dakota Weirs, we ask you to consider the total amount of damages caused by Lush fertilizer taking away the dreams of a girl and her only lasting connection to her grandfather, which was through her music. Although we cannot reverse what has happened to Dakota Weirs, we can put an end to Lush prioritizing profits over people. Thank you. And uh, from the defense. Plaintiff is using the wrong science and Dakota Weirs is suing the wrong defendant. Now it's time for the right answer. Wrong science, wrong defendant, right answer. Let's take a look at the science that opposing counsel presented today.
In an effort to prove that a chemical called Drufo caused Ms. Weir's cancer, plaintiff is relying on a study conducted by Casey Rogers, a study that Rogers herself testified was inconclusive. And the only other science that opposing counsel presented today was an email that Carson Durst, who clearly has a grudge against Lush, claimed to have received. This alleged email suggested that Drufo could be a carcinogen, but no one else has ever seen this email. An inconclusive study, an email that no one else has ever seen members of the jury, that's the wrong science. But my co-counsel and I called witnesses to the stand that presented the right science. Dr. Devin Williams, head of Lush's research labs, testified that her labs found no evidence that Drufo could cause cancer. Skylar Weirs testified that in her extensive research, she has not come across a single credible study that links Drufo to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So Lush used the right science in the development of Drufo. But opposing counsel is arguing that Lush ignored that science because the company did not bake its fertilizer. Members of the jury, I would like to make one thing clear. Eliminating all reasonable risk does not mean eliminating 100% of risk. Lush did not need to bake its fertilizer because Lush's research teams had already demonstrated that the product was safe. Now, not only is the plaintiff using the wrong science, but Dakota Weirs is suing the wrong defendant. We do not know who the real party or parties at fault for Ms. Weir's cancer are, but we do know that that party is not Lush. You heard Dakota testify today that she used multiple different products at her, at her job. Different fertilizer could easily be at fault or something other than fertilizer could be at fault. Something else entirely, members of the jury. Wrong science, wrong defendant, Let's talk about the right answer that you jury members must give at the end of trial today. Today, opposing counsel failed, failed to meet their burden of proof. They had to prove each element of negligence by preponderance of the evidence, but they failed to do that. Therefore, your verdict must be for the defendant. The evidence today showed that Lush exercise reasonable care to prevent its fertilizer from creating an unreasonable risk of harm. Dakota believed that the only risk was eye irritation because the only risk was eye irritation. Now opposing counsel is arguing that Lush put profits over people, but the company put people over profits every step of the way. They researched Drufo extensively before putting it on the market and did not find any risks associated with the use of their product. And despite finding no evidence that Drufo could cause cancer, Lush put a detailed label on their product with clear safety recommendations because Ms. Doncourt and her company care so deeply about each one of their customers. That members of the jury is putting people over profits. However, if you do find that Dakota was damaged as a result of using Lush fertilizer, you must consider Dakota's own negligence. She failed to wear any protective gear, which is something that reasonably careful people would do under the same circumstances to protect themselves. Now that's the direct and proximate cause of 100% of her own damages. Plaintiff is using the wrong science and Dakota Weirs is suing the wrong defendant. So you jury members must give the right answer. We ask you to find Lush Fertilizer Incorporated not liable for its negligence. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. I do believe that the plaintiffs have, um, I think 40 seconds uh, for rebuttal close. Yes, Your Honor, may I proceed? Please. Right science, right defendant, right answer. Dr. Rogers showed an increase in the likelihood of developing cancer through her study, not just mere statistics from a study that we know nothing about. 
Maybe Lush could have been the wrong defendant if they baked their fertilizer. However, Lush did not bake their fertilizer, making it dangerous for consumers, including Miss Weir's. Today, the plaintiff proved Lush's negligence and Dakota's lack of comparative negligence. Thank you. I do believe that concludes uh, round four, the tournament. Um, everybody should definitely give themselves a round of applause. You guys all did such an excellent job. Um, I do have some feedback while our scoring panelists are uh, finishing up their score sheets. Um, I tend to just go through each part of the trial um, as it happened and, and sort of uh, read out some of the things that I wrote down uh, for each person who did each part of the trial. Um, so starting with the opening statement for the plaintiffs, um, I believe that was Maddie um, Mullins. Mullins. Mullins? Uh, Mullins. Mullins. Okay. okay. Cool, cool. Sorry. Um, I really liked how you started with saying, put yourself in the shoes of Dakota Weirs. That's a very, very persuasive um, way to begin your opening statement. And it, it really is good storytelling. I was very impressed by that. I also liked your structure of your opening. Um, you know, understanding you can't necessarily argue in opening, um, you can structure it in a way that's really persuasive and uh, gives a good roadmap for the jury to be able to follow. I think you did a good job with that. Um, I also really liked the two pennies per every dollar um, line. I thought that was really persuasive and I just thought that was smart and clever and I liked it. Um, and lastly, I do like when you said that she doesn't have eye irritation, she has cancer. I thought that was a very good juxtaposition between the two um, arguments in this case that we saw. Um, for the defense, uh, Lydia Brisky, Brisk? Brisky. Brisky, okay, again, I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> um, your theme and theory was super clear right in the front end, and I liked that. Um, and, and that really was an excellent way to structure your opening and sort of how you guys did the whole trial and incorporated that throughout the trial. Um, the, you know, the rule of threes and like, you know, having wrong science, wrong defendant, right answer, like that is a very, very effective way to structure your entire case in chief and how you're going to argue against the other party's case. Um, I thought that you guys did a really good job in an opening, particularly, I liked how you delivered that. Um, and I thought you were very good with your understanding of the law and what you were laying out that the plaintiffs need to prove. And then also talking about your guys's uh, defense in this case as well. Uh, for the first witness from the plaintiffs, uh, Dakota Weirs, I believe that was Millie Bjork was the witness. Ms. Donda was the directing attorney and Ms. Senishin was the cross-examining attorney. In terms of the witness um, performance, I thought that your uh, testimony came off very credible and very genuine. Um, I liked, I don't know if this is something that you sort of practiced and, and did on purpose, but you're very soft-spoken. And, you know, this is very clearly a very sympathetic witness and it just came across really, really well and very credible. Um, and it, it worked. <laughs> um, in terms of the direct, uh, I thought that you had really good open-ended questions. Um, and it, you had a very good way of asking questions that led your witness uh, through their testimony. Um, obviously not in like a leading way, but it was clear, you know, for people listening to the questions that you were asking where you were going. And that makes it really easy to follow. And it's more persuasive when People aren't trying to like connect the dots in their own head. And, and just with your questioning, you're able to like lead them down the path. And I thought you did a good job with that. Um, also with entering uh, exhibit one, great foundation. I 
effective, good way to do it. Um, and your redirect, I thought was very effective, just you know, staying away from these leading questions because I think uh, people have a tendency to, on redirect, just want to ask a bunch of leading questions like it's cross. Um, but your questions were why questions, which are great. Um, for cross-examination, um, your tone and your pace and the way you started this cross was really, really effective. Because um, again, this witness is like an incredibly sympathetic plaintiff, right? Like it's a kid with cancer and you have to handle that very carefully. Like you can't just go super hard at this person and you did an excellent job of balancing like, okay, I'm sorry that you have cancer. And also like, you know, maybe, you know, we're not the people to be suing because of that. Um, and throughout the entire cross, you catch that same tone and that same, uh, just sort of like, I get it, I get it, I get it, but like, we're not the right people. And you carried your theme and theory throughout. It was a really good job. Um, Carson Durst, uh, Tommy Kissick, and Miss Melens and Miss, uh, I can't even read my own handwriting. I'm sorry. Did good. Um, for the witness, uh, you are you were very clearly like prepared. Um, you were really good at explaining uh, these studies, and you know you might have gone into some sort of expert testimony, but uh, you were allowed to. So uh, you did a good job. Um, it was easy to follow. Um, I will also say uh, you did a really great job of getting around this speculation objection when you're talking about. Um, this pressure that may or may not have been felt from management when you front end the answer to the question of, I felt like there was pressure. I felt as though it's excellent. Um, that is, you know, it gets you around that speculation and it helps uh, lay the foundation for your personal knowledge or just, you know, your perception of it rather than relying on uh, what other people were doing. Uh, for the direct, uh, again, good job getting in uh, the uh, two exhibits you did, this, the RAT study and the email. Um, great, effective, efficient job of laying the foundation. Um, also, your response to the speculation objection and like laying further foundation and asking those questions was excellent. Um, you, you knew exactly what you needed to do and you did it. And then you didn't ask the question again. And I was like, why? Come on. You just like went through all this effort to do that. Um, so just like, you know, don't get, you know, too caught up or too thrown off when that happens because you know what you're doing. Um, and your response to the hearsay objection, you clearly prepared for that. You clearly understood the objection was coming and you understood like what needed to happen. That was a good job. Um, in terms of cross-examination, you know, again, objecting to hearsay, that's a good eye. That's good issue spotting. Um, it was a well thought out objection. It was well-timed. Um, and I think that, you know, you also did a very good job with cutting down the credibility of this witness like that without necessarily getting that like mic drop moment, cause you're just not gonna get that witness to say it, um, but you can lead them right up to it. And then you just walk away and then you argue that in close. Like that is the whole point. So you wanna get out the testimony and get them right up to that, you know, inference that you want the jury to conclude from that. You just argue it in close. Cause again, your witness is never going to give you that big like, you know, oh my God, I'm confessing to this murder moment. It's just not going to happen. And you as lawyers need to uh, get the information in trial and then present it to the jury how they need to interpret it. Um, and your cross particularly, um, I thought did a very good job of laying that all out.
Um, for Casey Rogers, I think that was Kay Kyla Plutko, um, Ms. Dolan and Ms. Braisky. If I messed that up again, I'm sorry. Um, for your witness, like, again, you were very clearly prepared. Um, your tone and your pace was very good. Um, and your testimony just came across overall as very credible. Um, and you also clearly had a good understanding of what was in your witness's statement. I um, mean, you were able to uh, sort of get squirrely on the attorney that was cross-examining you, but in a very effective and credible way. So that, I appreciated that. Um, in terms of direct, uh, good job with the exhibits. Um, again, you, you, I think that you were laying this foundation to enter it as, a, as if it was a business record. You didn't get objected to, and so it just came in, and that was great. Um, but again, good eye for you know, figuring out these evidentiary rules and, and what sort of information you need out of that witness to get that in. Um, and I just thought that your direct of this expert witness was extremely effective and very clear. Uh, you, with the scientific stuff and like this technical stuff, it's hard to pay attention and it's really hard to like follow sometimes. Um, and so when you're asking the right questions, you're, you're making it easier and more persuasive for people uh, you know, lay people to understand. Um, and then for cross-examination, uh, I liked calling them out for livestock and bugs. I, I really enjoyed that cross chapter. Um, and I thought that the beginning of your cross was very good um, and just sort of like cutting down the credibility of that expert witness. Um, my only suggestion would be just doing that as a voir dire so that the rest of that witness's testimony is then sort of like tainted with, you know, all of the ways that you're calling them out for actually not knowing what they're talking about and not being qualified. Um, good one fact per question, cross questions. Um, and the uh, chapter with the inconclusive study and, uh, you know, the no safety recommendations. I thought that was really persuasive. And again, that's an opportunity to just get that information out and then argue in close that, you know, the best way to protect against these things is blah, blah, blah. Like she gave you really good stuff and you just got to like blow it up in closing. Um, for defense witnesses, uh, first one, Devin Williams, Ms. Perry, Ms. Uh, Big Good and Ms. Dolan. Uh, for the witness, I think that overall, personally, uh, th your witness testimony was the most credible um, and clear, understandable, clearly the most prepared. It was very impressive. Um, definitely, uh, you were just so well prepared and you also were able to like help your counsel get you through these objections. It was, it was very impressive. Um, for direct, uh, you did a great job laying the foundation for the expert witness. Um, and when I sort of messed with you and asked to lay some additional foundation, you did a good job. Um, you clearly knew what you needed to do and you did a good job thinking on your feet um, and being able to think of like those other, just like couple pieces of information that you needed. That was a good job. Um, for the cross-examining attorney, uh, I'll start with the expert Wadir. That was very impressive and it was very good. Um, and then you had a very good narrowed down objection to the particular areas that they would be tendered as an expert in. Um, personally, I think when you narrow stuff down like that, it's a little bit more like digestible for the judge to like think about rather than like excluding them as a whole as an expert you're like I just this is one thing like they haven't proven and it's persuasive and it's effective and it's good lawyering um so I was really impressed with your ability to sort of parse that out and then also like know to make that argument um there you did you also asked this question um sort of expanding on what wasn't research. And you started the question with, so this jury doesn't know. And like, I wanted to clap because that is such a great way 
to start a cross-examination question. Like it is high level cross-examination. It calls the jury's attention right back to you. It, it sort of like perks them up and then your follow-up was really good. Uh, I was really, really impressed with that. Uh, for Skylar Weirs, uh, Ms. Sutherland, Ms. Bryce and uh, Ms. Donda, uh, I will say that um, for the direct examination, um, I thought that your structure and your signposting was really persuasive. Um, again, this was sort of a complicated expert uh, to get through. And I think that you did a good job of maintaining your credibility and like letting your witness shine with your direct examination questions. Um, and I think as, as a witness, uh, you did a very good job with um, keeping that credibility and keeping your cool, even though like you're being sort of personally attacked for, uh, you know, reading for a year and then uh, wanting to be qualified as an expert. Um, for the expert voir dire and the, and the cross-examination, your voir dire again was just so good. Um, and narrowing, narrowing down that objection and what they were, uh, what they should be tendered in. Um, laying out like reasonably, like what it takes, like how many years it takes to become a doctor and then comparing that to what they just testified to is excellent. And again, like even if that judge says, yeah, they're still an expert, like the jury has now just heard this comparison that you've made. And so everything they say after that is then in light of what you just called into question. Um, and I will say overall, uh, is dawned on your objections during direct, you had really solid objections. You're really good at uh, issue spotting and uh, you know knowing when to object. Um, Blake Duncourt, um, Ms. Bennett Spurlock, Seneshin and Ms. Lenz. Uh, again, Ms. Bennett Spurlock, you were very prepared. Um, it was it was obvious that you weren't just reading from your witness's statement. It made it nice to listen to, and like you know, it was hard to like listen to somebody just sort of read out loud. Um, so you added your own personal style to it. I, it was very good, um, and you also, in the same way, handled this sort of sympathetic plaintiff, but also defended yourself in a very uh, thoughtful and professional way and you did it with a lot of tact and I really uh, was impressed by how uh, your testimony came across. Uh, in terms of direct, I liked how you started out with explaining sort of what was going on with this rat study. Um, and really you, you did a good job of um, what I like to call running to the bummer because like you front end your bad facts because when you do that, you give your case an explanation to explain these bad facts. And it lessens the opposing party's credibility when they try to come in here super hard on cross um, on these, you know, not necessarily great facts. Uh, you've already fronted it. You're like, I'm not afraid of this. This is what it is. And here's why this is going on. And it, it increases your credibility and it decreases the other side's credibility. Um, for cross-examination, I loved that you introduced the um, profit uh, emulative table uh, on cross. That was excellent, very cool move. Um, and it was a great way to sort of impeach that witnesses um, credibility and bias and motive and because they just testified about how they're like you know these philanthropist environmentalist corporation and then you're like why did you make this chart and that like you know said why you didn't bake this stuff so that was very good um in terms of clothes again excellent job reincorporating your themes and theories um you guys had a really good grasp on the law and what needed to be proven and what your defenses were. And I thought you guys did a really good job of explaining that on both sides as well. Um, and again, just sort of like both, 
both sides did a really good job of touching on their theory and reminding the jury of what their theory is throughout trial and then just bringing it all together in close. So I thought that was really effective. Um, and specifically for the rebuttal close, I do like how you sort of flipped the defensive theme back on them. I, it just shows that you're paying attention and you're thinking on your feet and you're listening. And that's, um, you know, it's not all just like scripted and robotic. Like you gotta be able to think on your feet. and. I think um, the plaintiff cited very well in closing with that, as well as um, the defense side, um, incorporating the other party's arguments into the defense closing argument and addressing them thoughtfully. Uh, you know, that's like, again, that's like high level lawyering. Um, so I was really, really impressed by that. Um, and Really, again, I, I, I think all of you did a fantastic job. I'm incredibly impressed. Um, I'm, a, I'm a public defender in Arapahoe County, so I'm in court and I'm in trial all the time. Uh, and truly, you guys uh, could, you know, go toe to toe with some of the uh, attorneys that I practice with. Um, and I'm just incredibly, incredibly impressed by all of your understanding and your uh, performances today. So good job guys. And I don't know if our uh, scoring panelists have notes. I didn't take the, it's their own notes as on every individual person as she did, but I, I do just want to congratulate all of you guys. I can tell how hard you've all worked. This was a fantastic round to watch. Um, it's an honor to, um, you know, sit in and be able to judge you. Um, I was one, one thing I did notice there were some times when maybe, um, you know, on direct or on cross when a witness didn't answer the question that the attorneys were the, the way that they were expecting and it kind of threw you off guard a little bit. Um, and like she just said, you had to think on your feet. Um, and once you were able to regroup, it was, you know, you were able to get right back on track. And the only way to improve on that is just through practice. Like the more you do this, the more you keep with that, you'll get better at kind of thinking on your feet, but great job, everyone. I've been uh, uh, doing the scoring for four or five years now, and uh, this is one of the uh, best groups I've uh, I've done. Um, I'm not in the uh, legal field, but uh, so I'm I'm basically exactly what you would see in a, a jury, and uh, everybody was very believable. You know, very they spoke very clearly and uh, we're very believable and everybody should be very proud of uh, what they've done today. Hi, um, I wanted to just say it was amazing to watch you guys. It was amazing um, to, to judge you guys and I am so impressed by how confident all of you came across. I just, um, I was so impressed your poise and how you carried yourself. Um, I'm sure after a couple of years of COVID, most of us are used to talking to people through a screen, but I'm still so impressed by how confidently you all came across uh, through a camera and through Zoom. Um, that confidence, you could feel it uh, coming through your performances and, and through your questioning. So um, kudos to all of you. I particularly wanted to um, mention to Ainsley, um, I felt like, you really understood um, how to make eye contact. And so there were a few times where you deliberately looked right into the camera. And I just felt like, well, you are looking right at me and like asking these questions. And I just thought it was so good to make that connection. I knew that you weren't reading. I knew that you were looking uh, into someone's eyes and, and trying to have that connection. So I just wanted to call out that particularly that uh, it was noticed and, and, I, and I felt it. Um, 
But overall, I just thought you guys just came across so poised and confident. Everyone spoke slowly. Um, certainly uh, a few had moments where you might have stumbled, but I thought overall, I was so impressed by recovered quickly, uh, were able to move on to the next point. So nice job. Thank you so much and um, great job to the other team. Thank you. Good job, everyone.